Beautiful. So this month, we're continuing to explore our global vision. And our theme for this month is kinship with all life. Kinship with all life. We are all related. And this is part of the vision of our world that works for everyone. And the quote for this month, or for this week, actually, is from a, a series of statements written by Ernest Holmes back in the 1920s when they asked him what he believed. And he said, we believe that the manifest universe is the body of God. That the manifest universe is the body of God. So that everything that there is, is from that one source, dwells in that one source. So, I have a reading I'd like to start with. Can you guess who I am? I am your constant companion. I am your greatest helper or heaviest burden. I will push you onward or drag you down to failure. I am completely at your command. Half of the things you do, you might as well turn over to me and I will do them quickly and correctly. I am easily managed. You must be firm with me. Show me exactly how you want something done, and after a few lessons, I will do it automatically. I am the servant of great people, and alas, of all failures as well. Those who are great, I have made great. Those who are failures, I have made failures. I am not a machine, though I work with the precision of a machine plus the intelligence of a person. You may run me for profit or run me for ruin. It makes no difference to me. Take me, train me, be firm with me, and I will place the world at your feet. Be easy with me, and I will destroy you. Who am I? I am habit. I am habit. So when we think about habits, Usually we think about things like, you know, I get out of bed, I make the bed. It's just a habit, right? I don't even think about making the bed because it's just what I do. So I get out of bed, I make the bed. It's a habit. Um, you know, we think of, you know, the way, way we make our breakfast. Maybe we have our coffee first. Maybe we have our food first. Who, you know, maybe we have a cup of tea. Uh, maybe we take a walk. You know, whatever our morning routine is, all these habits that we have. Habits of where we put our keys, you know, how we drive to the center. You know, if I'm not thinking wherever I'm going, I will end up here. <laughs> because it's such an ingrained habit to come here. So, and, but we don't think about the fact that we have all these habits of thinking. We have a lot of thought habits. And some of them we got when we were little. Maybe we were in a grammar school class and, and the class was singing and the teacher said, just mouth the words. You can't sing. Just, just mouth the words. Okay? You had that experience. And that thought was ingrained in your, in your memory. I can't, think. I can't sing. I can't sing. Or maybe when you were a teenager, you were very awkward because you hadn't figured out how this new body was working yet. And, you know, and you maybe were really awkward at the dance and you thought, well, I can't dance. I can't dance. I can't dance. And, and you just stayed with that thought. That became a habit of thinking. It's not possible. I, I, that's not my thing. And, um, you know, maybe we were called stupid at some point. And we took that on. We took that on. And we didn't just take it on as a thought because what happens is when we have that thought, neurons connect physically in our brain. Thoughts that, neurons that fire together, wire together. So we actually made a pathway. And if we continue to reinforce that thought, that pathway gets really deep and instantiated in our minds. And the other thing that happens is that thought creates an emotion. It generates some proteins called neuropeptides. 
And those get transmitted into our bodies and they create an emotion that creates a feeling in our bodies. Now the part that I didn't realize was that when our brain recognizes that our body has these feelings, it gives us more thoughts to experience that feeling. It reinforces that feeling. And so we get into a loop where our brain is generating the chemicals to create the feeling, and the feeling is generating the uh, message to the brain to continue to generate those feelings. So we get this little loop caught in our body, physically. So that's why we can't just change a habit easily because it's not just changing a thought, it's changing physical, biological wiring in our bodies. Now the good news is we can do that. We can, the brain is flexible. We didn't used to think that. We thought, you know, 25, man, that's it. You know, you're stuck. No, we have realized that there is flexibility. We can generate new paths in our brain. We, and the, you know, we can stop being addicted to our own body chemicals, because that's what happens. We get addicted to those feelings, the chemicals in our body that are generated by those feelings, those chemicals in our body, we get familiar with them and we get addicted to, the, to them just because they feel familiar. Maybe they don't even feel good, but they're familiar. And so we hang on to them. We hang on to them. And they continue to, to uh, penetrate, perpetrate, and you know, bring us stuff we don't really want because we've got this habit of thought. I'm not enough. I'm stupid. I'm awkward. I can't dance. You know, I can't sing, uh, I'm not talented, I'm not creative. And all these thoughts come in to get reinforced, get reinforced over and over and over again. And it's just not true. It's just not true. But the process of creating a new habit is not necessarily an easy one. I think I told you when I came back from the Salt Lake City Convention that uh, we had a presentation and the man said the latest research shows that you have to do something from 18 to 66 times in order for it to become a habit. I used to you know, hear that it, you know, if you did it for 21 days, you were done. Well, now it's more 66. 66 days, you really got a habit. So, what we do here in the science of mind and spirit is we invite people to have a new thought and to practice that new thought, to practice that new thought with affirmations and with um, exercises in classes. We do exercises where we're watching our thoughts sort of observing the trends of our thoughts, is the general trend of our thoughts. You know, thoughts are like this. And then, you know, you look at it. Is the general trend of our thoughts positive? Or is the general trend of our thoughts negative? And just observing that, not judging, just wondering, oh, what is the general trend of my thoughts? You know, I, I recently found that I had a thought that was part of the cultural uh, thoughts because we also are co connected to this collective consciousness. There's this collective consciousness of the human race. When we look at our teaching symbol, that's in the center part there. We have this collective consciousness from everything that's ever been thought. And so we're raised in a certain culture, in a certain country, in a certain time, and there are these thoughts that have come in not only from our time, but from our ancestors' time. And so there was this thought, you know, that, uh, well, as I age, my body is going to fail. And so it was just sort of a wondering, oh, I wonder what part of my body is going to fail. 
And then I thought, you know, I don't have to think about that. I don't have to worry about that. I do have to be mindful of my body because it's the vehicle, it's my spaceship, you know, it's my spacesuit. This is how I arrived, my, how my soul arrived on the planet in this thing called a body. And so I do have to be mindful of it. I have to care for it. You know, if I, if I tear it, I have to, you know, patch it until it heals, you know. But everything heals from the inside out, right? When you watch a cut, it heals from the inside out. Everything heals from the inside out. So it has to do with our thought process. And so when we re recognize a thought, then we can have a change of thought because every time I catch myself going back to that, oh, I wonder what, uh, <coughs> I do a cancel, cancel. Cancel, cancel. Like, cancel that thought and replace it with an affirmation, you know? I am whole and complete. My body knows just what to do. Every little cell in my body is healthy. Every little cell in my body is well, right? So now we have this affirmation. We have this wonderful little song. We can just remember that. So that's what we do, is we create a new pattern. But we have to repeat that pattern in order to create the new habit. And when we have created this habit of thought, whether it's positive or negative, it creates you know, a physical body memory. And that, that's what's running us. It's running our minds as well as our bodies. So we have to be aware of all of these wonderful chemical things that are going on in our bodies and how we can form habits and how we can change habits. Uh, I heard a story on NPR, NPR. right, okay. Uh, <laughs> These are my people. <laughs> so I don't know if they listen, but I do. Anyway, uh, there was a story on NPR, and it was by this educator, and he was talking about how when he was in high school, um, he had come from a really dangerous neighborhood. And so when he was in high school, one time somebody slammed a door, and he left his desk and hit the floor. Because when he was at home, if they heard shots, everybody hit the floor. And they heard shots a lot. And so they all hit the floor. And so he was in school, and when the door slammed, he hit the floor. The teacher sent him to the principal's office because she said he was joking around. He wasn't joking around. The kid has PTSD. <laughs> Every kid who's raised in a neighborhood where guns are going off all the time has P PTSD. Everybody who goes to war has PTSD. Everybody who is trying to live in Syria has PTSD. Post-traumatic stress syndrome. I mean, I was in Guatemala for an earthquake for a week, and I had post-traumatic stress system. Doesn't take that long to get on that high alert, paranoia, terror realm for a while. And then, you know, and then it's back again. You know, if we had an earthquake when I was in San Francisco a few years later, I was off and running, you know. I was halfway down the stairs of my building when my boss said, sit down! <laughs> said, okay, okay, I will. I was not, you know, because I was in the old reptilian brain, the fight or flight, right? I was flying. So that's what happens is we get into that reptilian brain. We get these... Uh, habits of thought, these habits that have come to us from time immemorial, and, and that's where they live, is in this reptilian brain. And what we have to do is recognize that that's where we are. Heard a talk yesterday by a uh, wonderful school principal talking about how she had a parent, parent come in with a child, and and the parent was yelling at her, and her first impulse was to go to the reptilian brain and get into defensive mode, right? She wasn't in the flight mode, she was in the fight mode. But she recognized that she couldn't go there, that she had to stop, take a breath, 
if we can stop and take a breath, we can move back into the frontal cortex. Because when we're back here, we're not thinking. We're in instinct and reaction. But when we move to this frontal lobe, we can think and we can choose to respond rather than react. And so she just listened while this dad screamed at her about what had happened to his daughter. And the daughter was there and the daughter said, you know, um, well, I didn't tell anybody. And the dad's still screaming and the, teach and the principal just said, did you hear what she said? And he just kept screaming and she, she just said, did you hear what she said? And he kept screaming and then she said, did you hear what your daughter said? And finally he acknowledged that how could anybody at the school respond if she'd never told anybody? So then they could have a conversation. Then they could connect. Then the emotion could be released and the thinking process, and the dialogue process, and the connection process could happen. We are creating our reality. We are creating our reality with our thoughts, our actions, and our habits of thinking, our habits of being. And so we're invited to shift that, to change that, to realize and recognize that we have that capability and possibility absolutely available to us. Part of it is that we have to, we have to be patient with ourselves. We have to be merciful with ourselves. We have to be non-judgmental with ourselves when we discover these habits of thinking. It's not like, I'm bad because I think this. No, we, in uh, Parker Palmer's book, he invites us to change judgment to wonder. I wonder where that came from. I wonder how that happened. You know, and when we wonder, wonderful information can come to us. I was telling, a group that I was with my book circle about, um, you know, my dad gave me boxing gloves when I was five years old and taught me to box. Now, I'm a five-year-old little girl and he's teaching me to box. And, um, you know, and when I tell people that, there's like, what? And then, but I, then I realized that before he did that, I had had two experiences in my neighborhood in San Francisco. I was born in San Francisco and lived, you know, on the streets of San Francisco because that's where all the kids were hanging out was on the streets. And we had big, big fat sidewalks so we could roller skate and all that stuff. Anyway, most of the kids were boys. There were a few girls, lots of boys. Well, one time uh, I got tied up by some boys in an empty lot to a, to a, to a pole. And I was there, you know, just crying and screaming and nobody was coming, nobody was coming. And then finally one of the boys came back and untied me. And of course I ran home and told my parents, blah, blah, blah. Okay, number one. And then number two, I was playing with a friend of mine. We were on a log and her brother came by and he said, oh, let's play, you know, cowboys, whatever. And he tied us up. And then he rolled the log forward and we hit head first. So I had this big bloody nose. So I went home with this bloody nose. So I think that's why dad bought me the boxing gloves. <laughs> I never put that together. You know, it was like, oh, oh. See, when we wonder, and you know, so when we wonder, we remember, okay, that, oh yeah, that teacher, I, I didn't think I could sing because that teacher back in second grade told me to just mouth the words. And I've been living with that ever since. Maybe I could try to sing. Maybe I could just try and see, you know, it's only been 40 or 50 years. <laughs> Maybe something has changed in that time. <laughs> Maybe I could sing. When I first started out in the science of mind, you know, everybody was singing and I was mouthing the words because I didn't think I could sing. And so then one day I actually started singing and I actually, for the first time, heard myself sing. 
and was like, oh, okay, it's okay. Not great, but okay. You know, I could, I could sing. It's okay. I could actually hear myself sing. It's like, whoa, something entirely different. Yay. You know, um, so, so we can change. We can change our minds. And so we use these practices that we have in our, in our toolkit, the practices of meditation, the practices of prayer, the practice of affirmation, the practice of visioning and visualization, envisioning what it is we want, instead of getting stuck on what's happening right now that we don't want. We get stuck in, in looking at the problem instead of moving beyond the problem to a possibility. But the problem is between the old habit and the new habit, there is that scary space called the unknown. And when we're in that scary space of the unknown, where we, we've left behind the old thing, but we're not sure what the new thing is, we're in that scary space, but that's also the space of infinite possibility. Of infinite possibility if we let it be. If we're open to the thoughts and so we, that's why we meditate and we pray and we, we have our visioning and our visualizations and our studies of spiritual materials so that we can be guided by others who've made this journey and see what helped them and maybe we can pick up something along the way that will be helpful to us. We don't necessarily follow another person's path blindly because each of us are unique individuals and what works for us is unique. So we have to figure out what works for us. And in this month's Science of Mind magazine, there's a great article by Dr. Jesse Jennings, and I love his writings. And he says, prayer shouldn't be a last resort invoking some distant supernatural power to swoop in and fix a problem. He says, true prayer leaps up joyfully from a context of prior and unimpeded oneness with the source of all, despite any contrary appearances at the level of form. Consequently, that appearance is free to change or to depart, which it is in the process of doing anyway, as all things are. Every thought is a prayer in potential. And prayers that yield results are composed of thoughts wrapped in the feeling of welcoming and freedom. Prayers that have the best results are composed of thoughts wrapped in the feeling of welcoming and freedom. So we're thinking about what it is we would like to have instead. And we think about it in terms of, of qualities. Um, the book for this month uh, is a book called A Life of Being, Having, and Doing Enough by Dr. Wayne Miller. And he's a wonderful writer. And he talks about how he says, when Jesus described heaven, he rarely spoke of a place, but described a quality of heart, a practice of attention, a way of being lovingly awake, awestruck by the beauty and grace of ordinary things we might easily overlook. I'm going to read that again. He spoke of a, he didn't speak of a place, but a quality of heart, a practice of attention, a way of being lovingly awake, awestruck by the beauty and grace of ordinary things we might o ordinarily overlook. So this is a call to us. It's a call to us to be awake, to be aware, to realize the possibilities the infinite possibility that is available to us in the space between the old and the new, the old habit and the new habit, the awakening to something entirely different. And, you know, the letting go 
of what no longer serves us. There was a thing I saw on Facebook, you know, spirit is working everywhere, um, where this uh, psychologist uh, asked an audience, uh, how heavy is this glass? And people are saying, you know, 12 ounces, or they're saying, you know, 20 ounces, whatever. She says, it's not about the absolute weight of the glass. It's about how long I hold it. If I hold it for a minute or two, no big deal. If I hold it for an hour, I probably have an ache and a stiffness. If I hold it for a day, I'm paralyzed. If I hold it for a day, I'm paralyzed. And so if we're, you know, this, it gets stuck. And that's the thing about our thoughts. If we hold that negative thought for a moment and let it go, no big deal. If we hold it for an hour, eh, it's going to be sort of making our day a little rocky. But if we hold it for a week, we may not be able to get out of it. We may be stuck. So we have to think about what we're thinking about and be willing to let it go. Be willing to let go of these habits that have captured us. Wayne Miller also says, we cannot hope to create enough of anything in an instant. A life that becomes spacious and full is a life made of moments chosen carefully. Decisions that each, one by one, lean into an abiding trust in the power of life, the fecundity of love, and the wholeness of our own heart's wisdom. So a life that becomes spacious and full is a life made of moments chosen carefully, decisions that each one, one by one, lead in, lean into an abiding trust in the power of life, the fecundity of love, and the wholeness of our own heart's wisdom. So we're invited to trust in our own heart's wisdom, in the power of the infinite possibility that is all around us and to allow that to make itself known to us to practice a deep and sacred listening to our inner wisdom for the next right thing we are required to do for our own benefit and the benefit of all for a world that works for everyone so I invite you to join me in our week's affirmation on page uh, two of your bulletin. It's a little long today, so. I listen in this moment for what feels to be the most clear, true next thing to do. So I listen in this moment for what feels to be the most clear, true next thing to do. I listen in this moment for what feels to be the most clear, true next thing to do. I listen in this moment for what feels to be the most clear, true next thing to do. And so it is.